Towards the end of your presentation, you talked about expansion of complicity and how this is going to be something to look forward to monitoring or evaluating in the future. So could you just um, explain why you think that will be rising to the forefront? The, let me explain first of all about what complicity means. So complicity often arises where um, the person is not doing the act itself but is in some way involved in facilitating the act. So it arises in the criminal law context where um, uh, I'm not doing the murder, but I'm driving the getaway car. So that would be complicity. So in terms of conscience claims, it arises because um, some people will be wanting to claim that even though they're not involved in the immoral act that they regard uh, as taking place, that in some way they are facilitating it. The, the reason why it's, it's problematic is because it has the potential for um, expanding um, well beyond um, what would be um, uh, possible to accept in most democratic states. So, so the reason why it's interesting to um, think about it as a future issue uh, is because as the attempt to gain conscientious objection, successful conscientious objection claims in the complicity uh, context um, expands, then the courts and indeed the political sphere is going to have to consider where enough is enough. Second question, what is your argument for increasing religious literacy and what is its utility in law? So um, what I mean by religious literacy is the idea that uh, we should um, attempt to understand at a deeper level um, what um, the theological debates are um, in a religious context, particularly where those theological debates um, mean that the um, answers um, are more complex, more nuanced, more subtle than uh, is sometimes pretended in the political context. So some of the arguments, for example, that are used by religious advocates for conscientious objection um, neglect um, the more uh, ambiguous relationship to conscience that uh, most major religions uh, events have. So what I'm suggesting is that, um, for example, um, there is a contrast between um, the political claims that are sometimes made by um, those who are purporting to act uh, or represent a particular church and the actual subtleties of um, and moral ambiguities that are reflected in um, the theology of those churches themselves. This debate of absolutis absolutism versus proportionalism evolved and incorporated conscientious claims. So, so the contrast is, is between, uh, that I suggested in the lecture, uh, uh, is between um, those in Catholic moral theology uh, who uh, espouse uh, an idea of how to determine a moral act based largely on rules uh, and on the notion of the act itself, um, where there's an idea that certain actions are intrinsically evil irrespective of intention or circumstance, um, which I'll call absolutism, um, contrasted with an approach that's often more um, uh, familiar to the recent um, uh, writings of Pope Francis, where the notion is rather one of determining whether an action is moral or immoral based on circumstances, based on the effect on others. Um, that's often called um, proportionalism. Um, so there is a contrast within Catholic moral theology between um, absolutism and um, proportionalism. That um, plays in potentially to debates in the public sphere um, because quite often um, the more absolutist approach is the one that's projected by religious advocates rather than the alternative.